desperately need your spirit to guide and open our eyes to the truths of the word. And as we have the illustration here, Lord, of the serpent, we know Satan wants to always keep truth from us. But I thank you that, as you say, he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. And your spirit is in us, because we've given that promise. So open our eyes to see, ears to hear, and they would be blessed because we chose to be here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, when I wrote this book on the um, on Mary Bose, how it came about, uh, Scott Cady is the son-in-law of the pizzas, and he was visiting over at Cyan Dory's home, and I, I was visiting him one time, and when he was there, and Scott Cady works for Pacific Press, and he has a say into uh, books that are published. There's uh, kind of a committee and all. And as we were talking, he said he'd be interested in seeing a book on miracles. Well, I hadn't thought of that before, so as we talked there, I thought, yeah, okay, I think uh, we can do a book on miracles. And that, that's the reason this book was written. I feel the Lord was definitely in that. And uh, it was good for me to go through it. And I pray it would be good for us, too, as we <coughs> go through it. Um, the, uh, a brand new book that's coming out. It, they have the manuscript. They're actually wanting one a year. And the new book that will be number 10 for a day book is on the law of God. So um, we may take somewhere down the line. Once the book comes out, it'll be out next year. We'll get that. Uh, book number nine is on praise. And um, that one just came out. And we might use that sometime next year, not sure. Just kind of let the Lord lead, you know. I never know exactly what he's going to do. That, that's why, by the way, you know, some pastors have, and I'm not criticizing them for it. Everybody works in their own way. They feel convicted. Many have what's called a sermonic year. They plan their sermons for the whole year. So they cover, you know, a lot of different subjects. The Lord hasn't led me that way because I never know for sure what he wants me to preach. So uh, I, I just, after I'm done with one sermon on Sabbath, I start talking to him and say, well, what do you want next, Lord? Now, the last series, I knew that was a series. So I did adjust it some, but uh, that was a series on prayer. So I was asking this Sabbath what he want for next week. And uh, I feel comfortable. We're going to talk about Peter. From self-centered to Christ-centered. So, we'll be looking at that this time. But today, as we get into this lesson on miracles, as I was uh, thinking about the how to begin the book, it made sense to me to begin with the land of no miracles. We live in a place today that we need miracles. <laughs> but there was a time on planet Earth when miracles were not needed. It was a perfect world. Um, in a sinful world, we need miracles. And as I was doing this on miracles, it dawned on me, at least the vast majority of the time, miracles are needed to overrule the consequences of sin. That's, that seems to be, a, in my mind, kind of a simple definition. Miracles overrule the natural consequences of sin. And so we're going to start out in looking in at those areas. But the first lesson, day one, we'll see what that perfect world was like and, and what happened. When we read in Genesis, the original home that God made for man, Genesis 2, 4 to 10 and 15 to 23 says, these are the generations of the heavens of the earth and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. The Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, so man wasn't created yet. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the face of the whole ground. 
So in the beginning, before the flood, there was no rain. The ground was watered by a mist, mist that came up. By the way, that can that should give you an insight why Noah would be considered crazy. Yeah. Because it never rained. What in the world are you talking about? That it's gonna rain. What, what, what is that? So so before the flood, back here at the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, this is how the ground was watered. It needs water, but this is how they did it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Well, that's a very important point, too. You notice God, man, man is certainly part of this world. We were created out of the dirt of this earth. And he formed man perfectly. And then it says here, he, he breathed into him life. So when man was first created, the dirt itself, there was no life there. But, but he was perfect. Perfect man. Then he breathed into him this breath of life. Notice, it doesn't say he put a soul in him. It says he became. Well, that's important. <laughs> it's interesting how some very little things, nuances in the, in the scripture, can bring out something very important is that God made man of dust and breath of life, and those two together, you're a living soul. Amen. Now, when we die, there's scriptures that tell us the body goes back to dust. And the breath, back to God. Where's the soul? If you don't have body and breath, don't have souls. So that one simple little scripture could avoid a lot of confusion in the world. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. So he made the whole world and then he, now he has a garden. And there he put the man whom he had formed out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight. They were very beautiful then, I'm sure. They're beautiful now. Hmm. Good for food. Tree of life, also in the midst of the garden. By the way, the tree of life is how God sustained life for man. As long as man had access to the tree of life, he could live forever. There was that tree of life. So it was something organic. Man was not created eternal. God's eternal. Man was created to be a temporal being, but as long as he had access to the tree of life, okay, he could, he could live forever. And there was another tree there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Adam and Eve knew good, right? But they didn't know evil yet. Okay. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was Parted and became into four heads. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So there was work for him to do. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I'll make him help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air and brought them to, them to Adam to see what he would call them. And you know, it, it shows I don't know, it, it's kind of nice when you think about it. God could have named them and said, okay Adam, this is a bear, this is a lion, this is a... Adam, this is your world. Now, you can start naming these animals. Now, it shows you kind of a relationship that how God created Adam and, and uh, responsibility on um, what he had there. So it says, what he called them, Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, the fowl in the air, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found to help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. 
And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stepped there up. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her to the man. So a woman was made from Adam, from Adam's rib. Uh, there was life already in Adam. So from Adam's life that God had given, now he created a woman from Adam. And when you look, uh, I've read some commentators on it, uh, Eve was created from Adam's side, not from the foot to be walked over, <laughs> not from the head to dominate the man. They were actually to be equals Amen. and um, work together. Um, that was God's plan. And if they were both sinless, there would have been in the perfect harmony that God desired there to be. So there's some little lessons here um, in even the creation of Adam and Eve. Now, so when you look at this uh, this world, they, they had abundant food, no rent or mortgage to pay, no financial needs at all, no destructive forces of nature, you know, storms, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, um, no sickness or disease, no death, no wars, no miracles were needed. Yeah. They had everything that they would need. So, um, pretty nice place. Well, also in relation to God, uh, Adam and Eve were, were made in perfect harmony with God and with one another. Since they were both in harmony with God, they would be in harmony with one another. I, I've seen the illustration, even in this world, used um, the hub, the picture of a wheel with spokes, yeah. and the hub is Christ, yeah. and the closer you get to the hub, the, the spokes get closer, and that's how we are. We're like the spokes in that wheel, of humanity, if you will. And the closer we get to Christ, the closer we will come to one another. Yeah, that's just how it works. So, they, Adam and Eve actually walked with God. It tells us that in Genesis. Um, the relationship was perfect. There was no need to heal, a uh, miracle to heal broken relationships. You know, I, I, I've been involved with... Um, healings through the years, and I, there's been many times people have told me the emotional healing for them was actually more important than the physical healing. Because um, broken relationships, emotional baggage can, can be pretty painful. When you think of the suicide rate, especially among young people, and you know, it's hard to believe, I don't know. Our, our children are all grown, and grandchildren are grown. I don't know what the young people are facing today, but you get little glimpses with the internet and what is it, the things they do, communicate with each other, and it can get pretty nasty, I guess, out there, and bullying and all that. And, and for kids, to let them commit suicide, it's sad, the pain, and, and, and you know, suicide, to commit suicide, the pain of living is, less, is more than the pain of dying in their mind. The pain of living is more than the pain of dying when someone goes forward with suicide. So those things can be very, very emotionally painful and overwhelming. Well, there was none of that, of course, back then. Um, that's how it was. However, it changed pretty quickly. By the way, Jewish tradition, and I don't say this is true, but it's interesting little things you pick up. Jewish tradition says Adam and Eve were in the garden 39 days. <laughs> now how long was Christ in the wilderness? 40. 40. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know if there's anything to that, but that's Jewish tradition. Um, and so, and, and remember, when Christ came, he had to recover the ground of Adam and get the victory everywhere where Adam lost. And he had to, you know, Adam was a man, he, he lost this world. God gave Adam authority, dominion in this world. He was the authority here in God's stead. It was lost by a man. Well, it had to be re-won 
by a man, and that was Christ becoming human. So here's what happened. We read in Genesis 3. Didn't take very long. Now the servant was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now it appears the serpent was probably a very beautiful creature because later on God tells the serpent you're going to go on the ground and eat dust and so forth. So I think it's kind of nice, this little serpent we got here, brilliant in color. Like the rainbow. Could, like the rainbow, yeah. He could, he could get around. He wasn't crawling on the ground like uh, we see serpents today. Might have had wings. He could fly. Uh, very, very beautiful creature. And so he said, but it was very subtle. You know, he um, pretty smart creature. Um, and he said to the woman, now imagine yourself walking by this thing. And all of a sudden it speaks to you. What? That kind of gets your attention, right? Huh? If it did happen now, you know who it'd be, right? <laughs> At least with what it said. One time God did speak through a donkey, right? Yeah. Read the Old Testament. Yeah. Is that Balaam? Yes. Yeah. yeah. God will speak through who he chooses. But Satan can too. And he does. He um Satan does a lot of such things to animals even, so. Okay. So here we've got um, the serpent, and, uh, and he said to Eve, to the woman. So it appears Eve separated herself from Adam. There's always strength in numbers. By the way, that can go for good or bad. Uh, you get two or three people together that are not so good, they can, they'll kind of err, you know, egg one another on. The other side is good too, though. People that want to serve the Lord, there's a strength in encouraging one another. <coughs> well, it appears she wandered from the side of Adam. And he said to her, you, um, he said to the woman, has God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So Eve knew. No question about it. Eve knew God's command. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. He's called the father of lies. That's, uh, by the way, that's really the only weapon he has. But he's good at it. If you look at everything he does, all of his temptations, it's all lies. Um, you know, you have sometimes these images, uh, apparitions, and they let people bow down to, that's a lie. It's, you know, pretending to be somebody. Everything, that's, that's his weapon, is the lie. And that's why you must have truth. That's the only way you encounter a lie, is know what truth is. And we just did a series on the armor of God. And what's the first thing mentioned? Belt. Oh, truth. Yeah. I don't know truth. Get in the word. Okay. And so she knew what God said. And the serpent said to the woman, you should not surely die. That's another lie he tells people too. When you die, you don't really die. You go somewhere else. Now a lot of different religions have different theories on that. Some have reincarnation. When you die, you go and you become another person. Or you become an animal. Um, others have that when you die, you go to some other higher level. So this, this lie that began in the Garden of Eden, Satan's continued down through time. You shall not surely die. Now, I, I won't give you all the verses, but one text comes to mind very clearly. In the Old Testament, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So the Bible says one thing, Satan says another. Then he says, for God does know, and the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, He's implying that God is keeping something good from you. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, what do you think she saw was good for food? Do you think the serpent was eating some of it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It looked pretty good. So I saw it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes. So it was a very beautiful fruit. And a tree that was desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. So, we also see two things went on here. Eve was deceived. She believed his lie, Satan's lie, the serpent. Uh, and so she was deceived and went ahead and disobeyed God. Adam wasn't. Adam knew. He knew what Eve had done. And so she brought it to him, and now he had to make a decision. Was he going to choose God? Or choose his wife, one or the other. So he wasn't deceived in that sense where she was. But as soon as that happened, sin brought destructive consequences to the world and mankind. And miracles became needed to intervene for God's blessing. Because God wants to bless us. But miracles had to take place to allow God's blessings to come, to overrule the consequences of sin. So that's day one. Now as we go into day two, now we're going to start looking at the miracles. And we, we're going to start the very foundation, God's first great miracle. Um, when God originally created man, we read here in Genesis 1, 26, 27, God said, let us make man in our image, in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So man was created in God's image or likeness. Man was created for a close, intimate relationship with God himself. Um, this would indicate that man and God were very similar in their desires, um, their likes, their dislikes. Man was naturally uh, out of harmony with Satan. Satan wanted to disobey God. Uh, Adam and Eve naturally, originally, would have been in harmony, wanting to obey God. To obey God. That would have been natural for them. Um, they walked with God in the garden. You get that implication there. There's an interesting text in Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they agree? So Adam and Eve and God were all in agreement and in harmony. Now, when Adam sinned, the close, intimate, harmonious relationship with God ended. Sin came between. Um, and if they're, they're first at harmony with God and at enmity with Satan, well, when sin took place, it reversed. They were at enmity with God and in harmony with Satan. Total change took place in their attitudes, in their thinking, in their, their heart. Um, Romans 8, 7, Paul points it out. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither need can be. So, because of sin, we're what's called carnally minded. Minded things of the flesh, not of God. Um, and I don't exactly know how it all happened, and talking about biologically, um, but this enmity against God was passed on to the next generations. Because you read that in Genesis 5.3. Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. Remember, Adam was created in God's image. Then when Adam fell, he is no longer in God's image. Now it's his image, which is a carnal mind, 
a sinner at heart. And now it says when he had a son, his son was in Adam's likeness, not God's. Adam's image. So right here is the indication in Genesis 5.3. Again, sin is passed on down from generation to generation. So you and I come by it, our sinful nature, from our ancestors. All the way back to Adam and Eve. And um, there's a text in Romans 5.19. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So there it is. And by the way, there's um, there's kind of an interesting, which, which ties into the gospel too, down the line we'll see. There's a concept in the Bible that, um, and I'll use the illustration that the Bible uses. The, in Hebrews, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek is higher than the Levitical priesthood. And the argument that Paul uses is that Abraham, when uh, the enemies came in and, and took Sodom and Gomorrah and took Lot and Lot's family, Abraham gathered his men up and went out and rescued them and brought them back to Sodom. More or less before Sodom, of course, was destroyed. And the Bible says there is a priest named Melchizedek. And Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes of all. Well, tithing goes way, way, way back. Now, the argument Paul uses, the reason the Melchizedek priesthood is higher, of which Christ is of the order of the Melchizedek priesthood, is because Levi, which began the Levitical priesthood, gave tithes to Melchizedek because he was in the loins of Abraham. So this kind of thing, you and I don't think that way, but all of Abraham's descendants were in him, including Levi, when he gave tithes to Melchizedek. Therefore, the Melchizedek priesthood is higher than the Levitical priesthood. Okay? Now, what does this say then? Every one of us were in Adam. Yes. When he said. Therefore, we also sin. That's kind of a biblical concept. Now that carries over later on, we'll see in the, in the cross, that when it says, you, you were crucified with Christ. So, as, that's why Christ is called the second Adam. As we were all in Adam when he sinned, and suffered the death penalty, we're all, we're in Christ. Those of us that choose to believe in him. When he died on the cross. So he died. We died. Our sinful self. He was buried. We were in him buried. He was resurrected to newness of life. We were resurrected with him to newness of life. And when Jesus comes back. We don't have to die the second death because we already died in Christ. See how that kind of logic that now you and I in our Western culture we don't think that way, but that's the theology that you find in the Old and New Testament. So that's why it says here that. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So, okay. We were there. And it says here, as it is written, Romans 3, as written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who understands. None that seeks after God. All have sinned. I'm sure of the glory of God. That was the hopeless condition of mankind. So God had to work some kind of miracle. 
to save us out of this. And the first indication of this miracle is in Genesis 3.15. God said to the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, it should bruise your head and you should bruise his head. Okay. Initially, there was harmony with God and man. Enmity with man and Satan. Then when sin came, there was harmony with man and Satan. An enmity with God and man. The reverse. But here's a promise. God says, I'm going to work a miracle, and I'm going to change the heart. And I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Now, here's the first place, by the way, where woman is used to symbolize church. And that theme goes all the way through the Bible. It's the first place where you get that symbolism of woman being church. God is people. So he says, I'm going to put enmity. So there's the promise of the change that's going to take place. A miracle in the heart. And a, a, it's about a great, as great a miracle as you can get. Amazing miracle. And it's called the new birth or being born again. It makes sense if we're born natural sinners. Well, we've got to get born again. Then. And being born with a new desired heart. Okay? Jesus spoke about this. To Nicodemus, John 3. Jesus answered and said, And very early I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Very early I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Now, the first application of this is natural birth. Because every natural born person, you are born of the flesh. You're born of water. We're all born in water, right? How about the lady's water broke? Okay. By the way, that's why water baptism has some deep significance. When you're baptized, representing your born again experience, you're in water. <laughs> And then you come out. Yeah. So you they're born the natural birth, yeah. But you also must have a birth of the spirit, which is also called called the new birth, born again. It's a miracle birth. God brings it about. You can't make it. You can't say, Oh, well, I want to born myself again. It's kind of like, did you decide somewhere in the past, I want to be born a human? No. <laughs> Same way with spiritual realm. You, you don't make that decision. God comes in. Now you've got to make a choice. Am I going to respond to God's call in my life? But God's the initiator. In John, he says, I did not choose you. You, chose, um, you did not choose me. I chose you. So, he's the one that initiates. We respond to it, but he's the one that initiates. If he didn't initiate it, not one of us would want to ever serve him. Because we're natural born sinners. Okay? That's how deep it's in us. So, that's the born again. Uh, sometimes the, the born again experience is dramatic. Mine was a little bit dramatic. I, I mentioned that on Sabbath, you know, there was that night I went to some meetings and waiting in the car, all of a sudden, great peace came over me. And the thought, deep, deep down inside me came, nothing matters but Jesus. Now that was all foreign thoughts to me. i have been studying the Bible some, and I was interested, but right then is when there was a, a change that took place, 1966. So for me, I can point to a time when it happened. Now, a lot of people can. I think Paul could on the road to Damascus. <laughs> He's got a lot of story there to tell. Yeah. But there's others that's more gradual. Maybe they were raised in a Christian home. 
and they were growing up and gradually they were choosing the Lord and the time came when they were 100% fully committed. But it wasn't so dramatic as with someone else. But it's important to realize whether it's dramatic or whether it's a slower process, it's real. Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here if it hadn't happened to you. That's, that's the born again. Now as we go to the, um, the third day, and I think we can cover about three of the series here every, every time. So let's go on to our third day. The second great miracle. The first one born again. Second great is um, this insurmountable problem of sin. Justice required death. Death. It says the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6.23. A wage is something you earn. So we earn death. We deserve it. And that's this eternal death, second death. We, we earn that. Um, and a righteous person cannot stand in the presence of God uh, in his glory. You got a text here in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 8. He said, talking about Christ's second coming. And then shall that, King James said, the wicked one, New King James, lawless one the evil ones, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So if a, a sinner is standing in the presence of God in all his glory, he can't survive. Only a righteous person can survive in the presence of God. Only, only way. So God had to do something to get rid of this death penalty that hangs over all of our heads. And in order to do that, now remember, this all has to do with the man Adam. Man, a human. And so all of this salvation had to, it was lost by a man. A righteous man became a sinning man, an unrighteous man. Became subject to a death, a human death. So, everything that was to be done to save us had to be done by a man. It couldn't be just God coming to this world or an angel coming to this world. It had to be a man. And you've heard me say many times when God created this world and God gave Adam dominion, that means he gave Adam rulership here, authority here. And what was to happen here was to be done by a Adam and his descendants representing God and that authority was so completely given to Adam he could give it away. And he did. He gave it to Satan. And that's why Satan at his times called the God of this world. He took charge. And when Satan tempted Christ he said just bow down to me. Show him all the kingdom. He said bow down to me. I, these kingdoms have been delivered to me. I'll give them to you. And there's an element of truth in it. Yeah, they were delivered to him by Adam. Yeah. So this world was lost by man, and it had to be won back by man. See? So that's that's why. And then so what, what happened? John 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word was made flesh. I want to talk about Jesus. And dwell among us. We be on his glory. The glory is only begotten of the Father, full, Father, full of grace and truth. So God Himself became one of us. He became man. Why? We need a human righteousness. Because remember, only righteousness can stand before God. We don't need an angel righteousness. We need a human righteousness. So, Christ came and he lived a perfectly sinless life. Hebrews 4.15 He was in all points tempted as we are, even without sin. He obeyed God's law perfectly. He 
generated, whatever word you want to use, a perfect human righteousness. He overcame every temptation, every one that, that came his way. Now that's important too, because a little later we're going to see, and this we'll get into next time, um, because he has this perfect human righteousness, if we accept Jesus, our Savior, then he will give that to us. That's called justification. Uh, righteous by faith. It's, it's um, imputed to us. It's put to our account. So when God looks at us, he sees perfect righteousness. Okay? It's a good thing. <laughs> and also he overcame every temptation that we face and as we'll see next time he can live in us and so when we're tempted he not only covers us with his righteousness he will live out his righteous obedience in us to be victorious so it's still a man getting the victory you see that what man? The man Jesus Christ living in us. See, it's all on the man. It's got to be on the human level. That's where it's lost. Okay? So, he lived a perfectly sinless life, perfect righteousness for us, but he had to do something with our sin. See, his righteousness doesn't just cover our sin. You know, like a coat. No. There was still a penalty to be paid. And that's the death penalty we deserve. And so we're told in 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Instinct parallel. Tree. Serpent and tree. Lost. Tree, Christ on tree, salvation. It's my parallels. So, when he died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself. It says that in Isaiah 53. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he's bruised for our iniquities, chastised of our peace upon him, with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So our sin was placed on Jesus. He died for my sin and your sin. You see, God couldn't ignore that. He couldn't ignore that. He died as the man, if you will. He died for our sin. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That had to be the worst experience in all. Yep. All through eternity, Christ had this intimate, wonderful relationship with his Father. Now that relationship severed. Sin comes between. Because of our sin. He was willing to go that far. At that point on the cross, he could not see through the grave. That was it. Which tells us he loved us more than he did himself. He is willing to go that far. Now, because of this amazing miracle, we're covered with his righteousness. He paid the penalty of death for us, and we can have eternal life. You know the wonderful promise, 1 John 5, 11, 13. This is the record God has given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He that has a Son is life. He has not the Son of God, has not life. These things have been written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. That's important, that word know. You can know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And Paul kind of sums it up. Romans 5, chapter 5, uh, is the chapter that talks about the two Adams. And that's why Christ is called the second Adam. Romans 5, 519. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Kind of sums it up. Side? It's interesting that Jesus went to the Father after he was resurrected to find out if the sacrifice was adequate. That's right. That's right. Because Mary met him in the garden and he said, don't touch me. Because <laughs> he had to go to the Father to be sure it was perfect. Yeah, you're right, Simon. Okay, well, let's see how you did on your lesson here. You, you read it, you studied it, we've had a presentation. Now let's see what we get. Lesson one, day one, Land of No Miracles. What was the name of the Land of No Miracles? Garden of Eden? Is that garden on earth today? No. At the flood. Now before, before the flood, God kept Adam and Eve from going back in the garden after they said, before the flood. And they set an angel there. But after the flood, they took the garden of Eden up to heaven. It's in the newer. Because when you read in Revelation, there's the tree of life there. And so when the new Jerusalem, you know, we've studied prophecy, when the new Jerusalem comes back in this world, and the new earth, the Garden of Eden will be there. Amen. So everything fully restored. But the Garden of Eden. Describe what the Garden of Eden was like before sin entered. Abundant food, no rent or mortgage, no financial needs, no destructive forces of nature, no sickness, disease, or death. Pretty good place. You know, sickness. Satan did tell truth. If you eat of this fruit, you will have a knowledge of good and evil. Yes. I don't want to know about evil. <laughs> you know? But, and that knowledge, you know, sometimes the word knowledge carries relationship. So you not only have a relationship, a head knowledge of it, you will have a relationship with it. And boy, don't we all. As you get older, the more you know it, right? Pains, aches, stuff like that. Yeah. Why were no miracles needed in the Garden of Eden? Man was in perfect harmony with God. There were no results of sin on earth. What happened that caused miracles to be needed? Adam and Eve sin. That's why it happened. What do miracles do in relation to sin? Miracles overrule the consequences of sin. By the way, we're recording these and we will have on our website a page, The Power of the Gospel. So we'll have these presentations and these lessons on the website. If you have friends and want to see it. In whose image and likeness, and we're on day two now, in whose image and likeness did God create man? It is in God's image and likeness. What was man's original attitude toward God? Desire was in complete harmony with God. What change did sin bring about in man's relationship with God? Man's close, intimate, harmonious relationship with God ended. Man's desires were out of harmony with God. What amazing miracle did God promise to perform? and fallen sinful man. God promised to bring back harmony between man and himself and to bring enmity between man and Satan. That's why, the, I know you've discovered this too, the longer I'm a Christian, the less at home I feel on earth. When you look at the advertisements, 
politics, um, entertainment, everything. You know, it's it just not in harmony with it. Well, that's a good sign. You're, you're, it's a, you know, you're a pilgrim here. You're passing through a foreign land on, your, on the way to the promised land. So the more we are in harmony with God, the less we'll feel at home here. Yeah. What did Jesus call this miraculous experience that brings man back in harmony with God? Being born again or born of the Spirit? Some call it a new birth. You've probably heard the expression, born once, die twice. Yeah. Born twice, die once. Yeah. If you live when Jesus comes, born twice, never die. Yeah. <laughs> you want to have to die that first death. But generally speaking, born twice, die once, yeah, but you know, it's not a big deal according to God. There's a text that says God is not the God of the dead, He's the God of the living. Now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all dead, but not in God's sight. They're asleep. Why do we know that? Because when Lazarus died, the disciples said, Oh, you know, we've got to go, you know, oh, Lazarus dead. He said, No, no, Lazarus not dead, he sleeps. So, sleep. What change must happen in man's heart in order to enter the kingdom of God? Man must be born again, which gives him or her a desire to obey God. After man sinned, what just punishment did man deserve? Death. As I've said numerous times, I'm sure you heard me say it from the pulpit, no matter what problem you face in this world, it will never be as great as the sin problem that you face. And if God is able to get you out of the sin problem, which is the greatest problem you will ever face, I guarantee you he can get you out of any other problem. I don't care how big it seems, <laughs> but this is the biggest problem that you will ever face the sin problem in your life. What would happen to an unrighteous person in the presence of God's Lord? Kill, destroy. Remember, uh, Moses said, <coughs> excuse me, to God, show me your glory. Oh, uh, God said, I can't do that. But I'll proclaim my name. I'll review my character. You know, that should tell you something about the character that those who are living when Jesus comes have attained. They're going to stand in the very presence of Jesus in all of his glory and not be consumed. Moses couldn't do that. But if you're living when Jesus comes, you're going to have to do that. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is living in you 100%. And his glory, righteousness, character is shining out of you 100%. And it's glory, meaning glory. And that's why it says in 1 John 3, 2, my little children, I write to you that you, not that one. Um, now we're the sons of God, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he comes, we shall be like him. And the Greek word they are like is homoios, exactly like Jesus. That's why we need to be there. Stand in his presence. What did Jesus do to provide perfect righteousness for man? Jesus lived the perfect, sinless, righteous life. What did Jesus do to free sinful man from man? God's just death penalty. He took our sins upon himself and died for our sins. Paid price for us. That's it. 
Next lesson, day four, five, and six. Okay, let's have prayer, and we'll get that lesson on the video. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study. We thank you, Lord, for the amazing miracles of the born-again experience. Jesus took our death penalty. We have his eternal life, his righteousness. Thank you, Lord, that you made it possible for us to live once again forever with you. It was your original plan. And I ask, Lord, you help each one of us throughout the journey of our life to ever be faithful to you. And when our Lord comes, we'll be certainly ready to meet him. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay. Same time.